And then this recorded version would be available on our city's website, which the link would be provided in a post webinar email. All slides, including Mark's presentations, will be available in City of Abbotsford website as well. We will include the slide link and the recording in a post webinar email. We also have polling questions for our webinar today, which is to interact with you, the audience. So if you want to join in and make yourself part, these polling questions <clears throat> can be accessed through slido.com, which is S L I do.com and then you have to type in the code 50786. Lastly, we do have a post event survey which would be mailed out to you after a couple of days of the webinar. We highly encourage you to interact and participate in this post event survey so that we can take in your feedback and provide events which are more helpful to you in the future. Now coming in in the city of Abbotsford update. So as you, some of you might all already know that city of Abbotsford has mandated step one for both part nine and part three building starting October 1st last year. As for the documents required for part nine building permit submission, you can take two pathways in order to meet the city's requirements. We as the city prefer the NR guide rating system for which you need a licensed energy advisor. For both pathways, you do require the BC Energy Compliance Report pre-construction form to be submitted. Currently, City of Abbotsford does not have a customized version for it. So the most up-to-date version of the provincial form will be sufficient here. For both the pathways, however, you do need to make sure that your energy advisor completes section F of the form. This is required for some data tracking purposes for the city. Now for the NR guide rating system, your energy advisor should be able to also provide an NR guide report, also known as homeowner information sheet. This is required by the city at this time. Other than that, the energy reports, which can be generated through HOT 2000 or any other energy modeling software needs to be provided for both proposed and reference houses. If you are not using an energy advisor, make sure that the full energy house reports are stamped with signature and date by the registered professional. For plan drawings, clearly showing all the energy, of, of energy efficiency upgrades is necessary. Moving on to part three building permit submission requirements. The city right now requires the part three energy design report. This is a provincial document which can be accessed through the energy step code website. But if you don't have a link to access, please don't worry. We are going to provide that link in our post webinar email as well. We also rely on letter of assurance, which is schedule B from registered professionals. The Schedule B should have the BC Energy Step Code section completed and not crossed off. Other than that, there are some few updates which we have seen in the current building permit process, which will help your building permit to be reviewed faster. Number one, make sure that for every building permit submission, you submit all the necessary documents. This reduces the backlog of going back and forth to you, the builder, or the EA to collect these documents. We're also looking for consistency in energy advisor reports and plan drawings. What it does is it helps our plan reviewers to easily review the plan drawing and the energy advisor report, and this reduces our processing time in a number of ways. And if you have been with me through that, it's time for our Slido polling time. So join us at slido.com, that is S-L-I-D-O.com with a code 50786. And I'll meet you there right now.
So you should be able to see my Slido screen right now. So I will give it a couple of minutes to just for everyone to join in here. And then we're gonna start the poll. You can go to slido.com and type in the code or you can scan the QR code right here in the screen. And you should be able to see the poll on your screen right now. So the first question that we're looking for is, which profession or industry are you representing today? You get some numbers here going through. We are expecting a mixed responses here so that our audience is from diverse backgrounds. We will give it a couple of minutes for people to get me up a bit. Thanks everyone, great responses in the poll here. Yeah, so with that underway, we're seeing most of our audience is from the building profession and builders, the architect and designer following up closely. We're just gonna go into the next poll, so get ready with your cell phones or your tablets again. So next question is, to what steps of the DC step code have you previously built or designed to? We have a step five, passive our standard, we are going up step four. We're just gonna give it a couple of minutes for the numbers to steady up a bit. I think that's steady enough. So, so we can see a majority of our audience have not built to any DC step code yet. Um, we have some with step four, so we'll be following in. Um, thanks for the input, everyone. And we'll go on to our last question here, uh, which is, how experienced are you in engaging and EA into your project? So we have some options where you have never engaged with an EA before, it doesn't apply to you, you're very new to the idea, some of you are getting comfortable now, and also some of you are well experienced with the project. And I'll let people settle in a bit. Give it 10 more seconds. So we got around, we got around 36 participants here. Okay, I'm just gonna close that up. With that being out of the way, uh, our next part is to introduce our speaker today. Uh, so our speaker here today is Mark Barnhart. Mark is the president of Barnhart Contracting, which built the first certified passive house in Vancouver Island. His credentials include being a certified energy advisor and passive house consultant. He chairs the PHPA BC Technical Committee and has been helping grow the knowledge and step forward throughout the province. With that said, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Mark for his presentation. Yeah. Your... Thanks for the introduction. It's, uh, I'm glad you used that uh, picture of me too. That makes me look thinner than I am actually now. So uh, 
have to uh, have to maybe get an updated picture post COVID here, but uh, keep using that one as long as we get away with it. All right. No worries. I think you should be able to see the center screen now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can you see it there without? Uh... Uh, oh wait. Hang on a second here. Just gonna shift. Uh, just gonna shift my screen around here so we uh, we get a, a better view on it. There we go. Okay. There we go. Now we should have the pro view. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're good now. Excellent. All right. So as we get started here, so I am for everybody listening, I am watching the, the chat window there and I will be stopping for questions from time to time just to to give ourselves a little pause and, and see if anybody has any, any burning questions. I'm not running off of a specific script here or anything. So feel free to ask questions. You're not going to throw off my groove or anything like that. And um, I do enjoy a, a good debate and, and even an argument from time to time. If anybody uh, would, uh, would like to do that, that's, uh, that's always good fun and, uh, and, and can make, uh, can make these sessions a lot better. So anyways, uh, yeah, like I said, I'm Mark Bernhardt. Thanks for having me here. Um, we uh, we traditionally have been a builder around my my company. That was our kind of bread and butter for a long time. But lately, we've been doing a lot more helping other builders build high performance instead of just doing it ourselves. And uh, that's where these um, these sessions sort of sort of come from and and how we uh, how we got here. So a little bit on uh, what what's on our or my schedule here today. Um, we're going to talk a bit about why we have step code. Uh, how to work with an EA and, and what you'll need to do there. And, and then an overview of the code itself and the different uh, different metrics. And I'm hoping we'll have time today to get to a cost-effective case study or basically how to do step code for free without spending any extra money at all. Because like I did notice that there's a lot of builders on this, uh, on this webinar. And if uh, you're a builder like I am, you're allergic to spending money and being as, and try to be as cheap as, uh, as you possibly can. And and that's, uh, that can be done on step code as well. So to start with, uh, with the why here, the, if we look at the life cycle impact of a house, that's the impact uh, you know, a regular house has on the environment. This is, this is what it looks like. We, we look at operational energy and operational energy is by far the most impactful piece of the pie when it comes to a house. The materials we use for that house, you know, they're, they're a factor, uh, but they're not nearly as significant as the operational energy. And then the construction itself, of course, has some impact as well. That's the diggers in the ground and things like that, um, but, uh, but it's not huge. Now, depending on how you build that house or where that house might be uh, constructed, um, that would change a little bit. So the, these numbers are for southern BC and in the you know would fit uh, would fit the climate. They're actually Victoria numbers, but that's certainly going to fit the Fraser Valley area pretty closely as well. If we were to build in the far north, that energy piece might be a little bigger. If we were to be building with mostly concrete and foam, that uh, materials piece might be a bit bigger. But the general story uh, stays uh, mostly the same. So of that green piece, where does it all go? And most of it ends up in the heating and cooling, even here in you know, the Canadian Riviera where it's as warm as it is in, um, or as warm as it gets in the country for most of the year, uh, heating is still by far our biggest load, followed by hot water. Auxiliary loads are like you know, charging your phone, cooking, things like that. And lights, and, uh, lights represent about 5%. So we see, you know, this is an interesting discussion because we see a lot of builders out there advertising that they're using LED lights, which is great. I mean, there's definitely a business case to be using LED lights. Everybody should be. But, you know, just using LED lights is not, um, you know, we're not saving the world, right? It's, it's, it has a little bit of an impact. It's definitely a good idea, but, um, but it's not necessarily going to deliver the performance uh, levels that we need in order to actually do something about um, a home's energy use, in, certainly in the long term. So that's why all the codes look at heating and cooling primarily, and uh, and then you know hot water as a sort of a, a secondary um, as a sort of a secondary thing. But that's that's the policy context of why cities, why the province, and you know the country is looking at um, is looking at codes like this. We need to deal with that uh, primarily that heating and cooling load. 
And then there's a number that you'll hear a lot of folks uh, throw around. That's that 15 kilowatts per meter squared uh, number. If you're if you've ever you know uh, been around a passive house, you've probably seen this this number. And you'll also see it if you're working in climate zone four as the top level for the envelope metric of um, of uh, step five. And you know. You know, I've been asked from time to time as well, why did they pick that? Did it just sound like a good number to pick? Did they just pick it out of a hat? And the good answer is no, it is not picked out of a hat. It's actually uh, picked for a specific reason. It is based on logic. It's not just some arbitrary goal that sounded like a good idea at the time. And and this is why. So and I think it's it's pretty obvious that, you know, as we spend money, we spend more and more money, our graph goes up. And as we spend money on insulation, our energy use goes down, right? The more money we spend on insulation, the less energy our, our house uses. But then a curious thing happens somewhere around 15 kilowatts per meter squared in that we can, all of a sudden, we can reduce the size of our heating system. So our furnace, a big furnace becomes a small heater and, uh, you know, other things like that, that we actually can save money. And that happens around 15 kilowatts per meter squared of, of heating energy in climate zone four. The further you go north, the higher that number is. So, you know, you, you drive a few hours north and that, that number might be 20 kilowatts per meter squared. And you'll notice that in the step code, it, it does uh, go up as you, the further you go north. And so that's why it's set there, right? It's, it's supposed to be practical performance. We can go to this level of performance. And then after that, the costs start going up and maybe we've got bigger fish to fry and it's maybe start, time to start looking at something else. And that's why it, the 15 kilowatts per meter squared. So it is based on a practical, you know, cost effective approach to, uh, uh, to performance. And that's why it's set the way it is. So the steps itself, I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen this, this graph uh, or this graphic around various different places. There's in part nine, there are five steps. In part three, there are uh, four steps. And it's just because when during the consultation, the part three builders felt like they didn't need as many steps and a lot of these things they were maybe doing already. And they were mostly just following the, the instructions of the architects and the engineers anyway. So they felt they could do it a little faster than the, the part nine folks. They wanted a little bit more gradual, but it's the same idea. The idea being that you start at step one, which is essentially Essentially enhanced performance or compliance and you, you work with an energy advisor that's our training wheels and we figure out how to do the process we figure out how to do the testing and all that sort of stuff and then we slowly work our way up through the steps um, and uh, to to the higher steps eventually at uh, 2032 is, is the goal there some of the municipalities around um, are already moving up the steps a lot faster than others um, some aren't moving at all uh, the all will be moving here shortly at the end of uh, 2022. Um, give her a little and take a little bit on the timing there. Uh, you know, the provincial government under Clean BC has said we're all going to step three at the end of 2022, but we know those timelines adjust a little bit. But um, but everybody will be on the on the road pretty soon. So, which is one of the reasons I, I really like to see places like Abbotsford getting on step one now because that gives us us builders a chance to have our training wheels on for a little bit. And then before we have to do something that has, you know, real teeth in the standard. So if you're going to embark down this, this journey, one of the first things we need to do is go find ourselves an EA and uh, maybe figure out how much this is going to cost and maybe get excited about some rebates and stuff like that. So if you're the, the easiest place to find um, EAs and rebates, is they're both in the same place is betterhomesbc.ca. This is a provincial website. It's clean, the Clean BC website. And you've got two portals there, one for renovating a home and one for building a home. And you just click on it. You say where you are, what type of house you're building and, or what, what you're heating with. And it'll give you a list of rebates. And, um, uh, and uh, it looks like this. So uh, these are, here's two examples of the, the things that it will spit out there. Say if I, I went and I said, okay, I'm in Abbotsford and I'm building with uh, a heat pump. Um, that would give me the list at the top there. And it says, well, if I hit step three, I can get a $4,000 rebate for being all electrically heated. Uh, they'll even pay my energy advisor $200 to fill out the paperwork for me. And if I don't have a gas line at all, I can get an extra $4,000 bonus rebate. Or, you know, if I'm working with gas and I'm going to have a gas uh, heating system and a gas hot water, uh, you know, I can look at step four there. I can get $6,000 in rebates and, uh, you know, 400 bucks for the, uh, for the builder for, you know, um, you know, putting up with the energy advisor on site and, uh, and then a hundred bucks for the energy advisor to do the paperwork, which is, which is plenty. 
and uh, and then a few other uh, rebates there for for some of the other equipment and stuff. So there's there is a lot of rebates out there. Some of them are pretty juicy big right now, and you know especially look at those step five rebates, right? Ten thousand um, dollars, you know, pretty uh, pretty juicy rebates there on the table, and you find them all on that Better Homes BC uh, website there. Then some of the local municipalities you'll find also have rebates um, listed there as well. Second thing you can find on that website is an EA too. So once you've been excited about the rebates and and uh, and stuff, then you need to go find an energy advisor. And on that website, in the menu, there's a is an EA finder, and it's the same sort of process. You type in the location uh, that you are working in, and you will get a list that looks like this. This happens to be the list for Kamloops, but uh, the list for uh, your area will look the same. There's quite likely a whole bunch of um, EAs on the list there. I'm sure some of them are here on the on the call today, and uh, and hopefully they can they can help me out with the the question I'm going to ask here in a little bit. Um, but this this page is important because it tells you not only the contact information for your energy advisor, uh, easiest you know very easy way to get in touch with them, but also what they're qualified to do. So not all EAs are qualified to do everything. But these codes at the top, um, you know, in particular, the multi unit residential, that's not something every EA has. So if you're building, you know, duplexes or, um, or, or stacked townhouses, thing, things like that, you may need to have an, an EA that's qualified to do multi unit residential. And that code shows up uh, in beside here. You know, if you see next to my name there, uh, I, I happen to have all of them, but then my staff member just above me here doesn't doesn't quite have all of them yet. So, so it's important to check that. So now we found our EA. Well, what do we have to send to this uh, this person? Well, it's it's not a whole lot usually. Um, we typically ask for uh, plans, and those could be your permit plans or maybe a preliminary set of plans if you're if you're planning ahead and starting early. Ideally, you're going to send your ventilation selection or or what you're thinking for your ventilation. That could be you know HRV, no HRV. Um, if you happen to have details on what you're using, that would be ideal as well. Your heating and cooling. Uh, plan and and quite often in early stages, people maybe don't know what they're going to use yet, and that's fine. We can make assumptions, but which way are you leaning? Are you leaning towards gas furnace, or are we leaning towards heat pump? And those are you know two pretty different things. So if you can, the, the more information you can give us, the 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 more accurate we can uh, more accurate we can be. And the same thing with the windows. So again, a lot of people don't necessarily know which window supplier they're going to use when they go in for permit. But as long as we know whether it's going to be a vinyl window, is it going to be an aluminum window, you know, that sort of thing, uh, then we can make assumptions about what it's going to be and your and we can we can do the preliminary modeling. So the more information you give us, the more accurate. It will be. But a lot of times it is relatively basic, uh, which what we go in for permit with. So what your EA is going to give you back. So the, the form on the left there is the provincial, uh, the provincial step code form, and it's the form that the EA fills out and uh, will complete for you. And the, the EA will also generate some auto generated reports so that the one is the full house report, which Abbotsford requires, which is the one on the left. It, I, I wouldn't bother trying to read through that. It's got a whole bunch of mumbo jumbo in it um, about, uh, you know, the home performance and stuff like that. If, if you want to, uh, put yourself to sleep. That's a good one to read, but it's really for the city to do a cross check of what the EA has done. That's why it's there and it's an auto generated report. I just click print on it and it comes out of our, our model automatically. What's really key here is uh, for the builder to check the permit form for us. So section B, which is the, the part right below the, the address. This one is really important for builders to check and and designers too, if you're, if you're working on this as well. This is where I list the assumptions that I used in the model, or I list the building assemblies that I used. So in this example, this house has two by six at 16 on center R20 bat walls. And if that assumption is wrong or that, um, that selection of, of assembly is wrong, we could be in trouble with our model. So if it's, if that's too high and you had a lower performing wall, um, the, the house may not pass. Uh, if it's too low, that's maybe not as much of a problem because we can correct that during construction and you can always finish ahead of what you said you would do. Um, just uh, really not very good to finish below. And what we're seeing now is a lot of municipalities um, realizing that uh, builders aren't used to going back to this form and checking it and um, instructing their staff to work according to this form. So we're, at, we're seeing a lot of the municipalities 
um, ask that the plans match exactly to this form. And this is the part that they're usually talking about is that the assemblies on your plans match this form. And um, I think you'll, a lot of you will uh, from time to time see the, the your permit get bounced uh, for not matching uh, the our form. And this is the, the place that they're talking about. So, and we have seen issues with that where we've put an upgrade on this form and, and told the builder, well, actually you've got to use R22 bat to get past the standard. Um, and they say, yeah, yeah, great. We'll tell the staff. And then that doesn't get communicated and the house gets built with R20. And then we're in real trouble because um, now the house has got a lower performing insulation in it than we had modeled and maybe the house doesn't pass. Uh, and that's a, that's a real problem at the end. That gets to be a real expensive problem. So having your plans match this um, is, a, you know, is, I think is a, a you know, real good thing and, and the cities will, um, will make sure that that happens. The last uh, auto generated report and something that the, the city of Abbotsford is asking for there is the homeowner information sheet. And um, again, this is an auto generated report that I, I click send out of my model and it, it generates it for me. So it's not like this, you know, big fancy long time thing that I'm, uh, I'm spending a lot of time creating. Uh, this is, uh, it's the standard enter guide form that um, is designed to be read by a homeowner. So it's in really plain language. It's got descriptions of what everything means. And we use this both for contractors that maybe haven't had as much exposure to um, energy efficiency as others and for clients. And it's an easy way for us to show where the energy is being used in the house and uh, where we might be able to improve. So, so for example, in this case, the main walls are showing that they're using 34 per, or losing 34% of the overall energy. So maybe that's a place that we want to uh, look at um, look at improving uh, this this particular envelope and uh, and that helps us guide us to kind of more a, a cost effective uh, a cost effective path to improving the performance of this uh, this home and a lot of our builder developers like to use this for marketing and because this is a third party verified thing that says your house uses this much energy and quite often it'll, it'll say your house is better than an average house and that's a great marketing tool um, can be uh, can be really handy So a couple of the, the frequently asked questions that we get about EAs, and I'd I'd like uh, some of the local EAs. If you're if you're uh, there with the chat window, if you could if you could let me know uh, on the third question there, how much on average for like a regular sort of average house would it cost for an EA to be in in your area? If you guys could put that in the chat window, that would be uh, that would be helpful for me because it does change a little bit for from area to area. The first two things, you know, when when to contact your EA, I would say as early as possible. Um, you know, ideally, we like to say at the napkin sketch stage when when your plans are just taking shape and and nothing's really decided yet, and maybe the client isn't fallen in love with it yet, and things can still change, and that'll help us out. Just having a discussion there of kind of the consequences of some features or maybe some limitations you might have on the lot. Uh, the earlier, the better. And quite often that saves us money in the long run. Sometimes we might end up doing two models or a model and then updating it, but that often saves us in the long run. Certainly it makes the, the um, you know, it, it makes the transition a lot easier because I don't have to go and say, you know, go to a client and say, well, actually the home doesn't comply with the step code. It's got to add all these different things. Um, and then I end up being the dream killer because, you know, now this house is much more expensive and I don't like being a dream killer. So the earlier we can start, the, the better. And the second is how long does it take for um, an EA to complete their work? So how long in advance, like say, if I'm going for permit, how long in advance of me going for permit, do I need to send this out? And that again, really depends on where you are and, and how busy your local EAs are. The actual work is only a few hours. So if I, if I was doing nothing else today and, and you sent me a file and I could work through it in a few hours, but, um, the you know we have obviously got a, a number of projects stacked up and so it really depends on how busy your ea is generally around the province the eas that i talk to it's usually about a week if you can give us about a week's notice um that uh that is really ideal if any of the eas on this webinar want to speak up about it being something different i'm happy to happy to broadcast that but that's that's what i say if, if i'm talking to our clients certainly i say you know give me at least a week i don't want to be the guy to hold you up so you know at least a week is um 
is ideal. More would be more would be better. Um, you know, if you want to pay triple the price, I can do it overnight. But um, you know, then you're then you're obviously paying a lot more because you're paying the overtime. And now I, I haven't had any responses on the how much uh, does it cost in the chat window there. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wing it since since nobody wants to weigh in on that. But in so and I'm I'm basing this on on you know the Vancouver Island area here. So in Vancouver Island, it's about a thousand dollars for the whole process. So that would include the permit compliance, the um, construction phase blower door test, and the final blower door test, as well as the permit compliance at the end. That's the whole whole kind of process there. So yeah, about about a about a thousand in our area. And I see I see uh, one of our, our EAs just chimed in there about thousand to two thousand. So. Yeah, and I'd expect that the 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 bigger the you know the fancier the house, probably that cost goes up a bunch more. We have seen a few beachfront mansions around in this area go up into the the two thousand dollar range. So you know, budget a little more if you're um, you know you're uh, you're getting into those those higher end houses and maybe the simpler houses, the garden suites, maybe they're they're a little less. And yeah, and actually a really good uh, really good point uh, from Elizabeth there. You know. Fees and, and turnaround time really depend on the size and complexity of the house, and uh, that's a really good point. The more complex, the the bigger the you know the more complex the needs of the projects, what happen, what have you, um, you know, the more scenarios a client wants to look at, that's going to affect the the cost, and you know, um, definitely. So yeah, if you've got one of those scenarios, um, certainly uh, certainly you're going to be going to be a little higher. Good question here about. Um, Multifamily too. What about multifamily and the cost of multifamily? You know that depends a bit too. So if we've got a row house where they are all, you know, basically all the units are exactly the same, maybe mirror images of each other, that can be really cost effective to model because we can model, you know, we model the one unit type and the other unit type, and then they're just mirror images all the way along, and we can go copy paste, copy paste, copy paste. So per unit, your cost is going to be a lot less um, in a in a multifamily situation for sure. So keep going. Yeah, keep those questions coming in too. I, I really like to see those. Um, we do uh, have a question about um, part three construction and uh, and how step code applies there. There you're gonna be using your en an engineer uh, to do the modeling. It's not going to be an energy advisor and uh, they'll be able to take you through that. Their forms and their reports are a little different. Uh, quite often they do have a standard form as well, but, um, but how they do that, they have a lot more discretion than the energy advisors do. The energy advisors are gonna be producing basically all the same reports and it's a standard report using a standard model and a standard form the engineers will be a bit different they have that ability to use discretion so um, uh, they will be a bit different the in terms of the actual construction and techniques and such um, I would suspect that that um, most part three builders will see very very little change until they're into the step three four range um, and then we might start seeing things change. Um, I mean, assuming you're building any sort of reasonable quality anyways, um, because most of the buildings will qualify in that sort of range. So on to the metrics. So now we've got our EA, we've got our rebates lined up and we've got uh, maybe our, our modeling. The EA is gonna uh, you know, give us some forms back and, and it is important to understand what, uh, what some of these things actually mean. So let's get into, uh, let's get into this now and, and what, uh, what affects what. So if you, if you open up the step code manuals, um, you will see uh, something that looks like this. This is the, the kind of the code table as it were. Now there's a bunch of numbers on the bottom part of this table. And I, I would encourage everybody here, unless you're an energy advisor, just to ignore those numbers. They, they are for your energy advisor. And honestly, I don't remember them. They, they change depending on the size of the house and depending on your location. So I don't even have those memorized. Don't worry about the numbers below. Um, what I think is important for builders and everybody else in the industry to understand is that there are three sections to this code. We have an air tightness requirement. We have a building or systems and equipment, which could also be called total energy or, or similar. And we have a building envelope uh, requirement. And that's the same, it's the same part three or part nine. Um, they all have, they have the same three kind of areas that the, the codes work in, um, but what those uh, you know, numbers underneath are will obviously be different uh, for, uh, for part three and part nine. As long as we understand that three basic areas. So when we send you back a file, 
um, that's ready for permit, we will say, yeah, it passed or maybe it didn't. And it, we'll say, well, maybe it didn't pass in the building envelope. So we need to improve your building envelope. And it's one of those three areas that we have to pass. We have to pass all three in order to, to get past a step. Within those steps or within this, uh, these metrics, we have two different types of metrics that are very different as well. So we have relative metrics or the percent better metrics. It's where we're comparing to something else. Like it's percentage better than a reference house. And we have absolute metrics, which are the per square meter uh, metrics. And uh, those we call absolute. So they have two very different um, uh, uses or very different design philosophies to get to them. And, uh, but they, they can be either or. So you could qualify for either or of these, uh, of these metrics in under, uh, under part nine. I'll start with the, with the absolute metrics and that's the, the Teddy and, uh, and the MUI. If you're building in part three, um, the, we don't use the MUI, you use TUI, uh, which is total energy. And I'll come to, uh, to a slide here that'll explain the difference in that. Um, it's a subtle, but important difference. So the absolute metrics, the first thing to understand is that there are different target zones. So I mentioned earlier that those numbers change depending on where you are. The colder areas have a bigger target zone. And the idea being that it is easier or relatively the same cost effectiveness to hit the code in a warm area as it is in a cold area. And here's two examples. These, these graphs we often use for some of our reports and it just shows the, uh, the kind of the size of the target zone that you're trying to hit. Uh, for these two areas. So Quinell, obviously quite cold, has a big cart target zone relative to Victoria, but theoretically they have relatively the even, an even amount of spending that you would have to do to hit those, um, hit those targets, or at least to get the same step. So starting with the Teddy. Uh, the Teddy is the thermal energy demand intensity. It's the heat gains minus the heat losses per square meter of floor area. An easier way to think about that is how hard is your furnace working to keep this house warm? That's, uh, I, I find that much easier to say. It was like, how, mon how much heat does this thing need to generate in order to keep this house warm? That's, that's what the Teddy is. To put that in another kind of graphic example, we lose heat through the walls, we lose it through the windows, we lose it through the slab, we lose it through the attic, and we lose th some through ventilation, like our bath fan dumping heat out. And those are the losses, right? This is what's trying to cool the house down. The gain side, we have solar gain, free heat from the sun coming through the windows. We have other gains like body heat, cooking, and things like that, um, that we could consider free heat. You know, a dog produces about 70 watts of heat, for example. We have mechanical waste heat. This is the, the heat coming off your hot water tank. Not necessarily always useful, but we can, you know, account for some of it, especially in the winter. And what's left over is the artificially generated heat. So that's the heating demand. That is your teddy. That's that piece left over. And what we're trying to do at step five is cut that in half and do this. So that's, you know, that's the difference between step five and uh, not step code. It's just trying to cut that in half. And we can do that in a few, a few different ways, right? We can conserve on the losses side by adding insulation to the walls, better windows and things like that. Or we can um, increase the solar heat gain uh, by putting more windows on the south. And, you know, that, both of those approaches can be completely valid. Quite often, it's a combination of the two that we use. Uh, sometimes do it going all solar is uh, is not the greatest, especially in our climate here in the on the west coast, where we get you know several months of cold, wet, cloudy that um, that aren't necessarily uh, great for using solar gain. Um, so a balance between the two is really uh, ideal. So onto the MUI here. This is the other absolute metric. This is the mechanical energy use intensity. And the, the simple definition is the total energy minus the base loads of, uh, of this and how, how that looks in, in graph form here. So we have, you know, if we, we talk about the total energy of a house includes the Teddy, remember that's from the graph before, right? That, that artificially generated heat. So these two are related, they're very related. Um, so if you have a small heating demand, your total energy is going to go down as well. So you'll see, you'll see them kind of uh, play off of each other. You know, this also includes the hot water load and then the fans and other mechanical uh, things here as well. So that top piece there is the MUI. Now I mentioned that part three uses a different metric. Uh, the big buildings, they call it a TUI or a total energy demand. And that includes those base loads uh, down there. It covers that whole graph. It's, uh, it includes the base loads. But in part nine, um, our codes are not set up to govern people's lifestyle. 
So that's why we exclude the base loads. We can't, uh, you know, we can't control somebody, you know, how long they watch their TV, whether they lose their, they use, leave their fridge door open all the time. Uh, you know, maybe they heat their house really hot or things like that. We can't control that. And that sort of thing would really have a great deal of effect in a single family house. The reason we can do it in part three is because, you know, if you've got a bunch of units, if you've got a hundred units there on average, you're going to get an average usage. Um, you're sure you'll get some wing nuts in there, leaving their windows open all winter and some people never turning their heat on at all, but on average, you will get um, a reasonable average. So that's why in part three, they call it a TUI. In part nine, it's a MUI because it doesn't include the base loads. So as far as what affects these two things, so we've, that's what the, uh, the two absolute metrics are. And now on to what affects them. The first thing that I, I need to talk about is shape, um, shape of the building, more specifically surface area of the building. This is one of the key, the two key factors in um, successfully completing a absolute metric. And what I mean by shape here, so if we imagine a building like a, like a one story rancher, that's a square, right? That's that square on the left hand side. If we were to take that uh, thing and maybe it had say eight foot ceilings and we added two foot uh, to that wall and now we have a 10 foot ceiling. That adds about 20% of sur surface area, more surface area to that wall. And that's what I mean by adding surface area. So if we took a house with eight foot ceilings, we added 10 foot ceilings to it, pretty significant increase. We can do that same increase by adding dips and doodles and bay windows and different things. Uh, without increasing the floor space, all of these houses along have the same floor space, but we've increased the surface area relative to that floor space. And what we find is that actually most spec homes, average spec homes uh, around this area are somewhere around 150% more surface area than that square rancher. And it's quite a lot, it's quite a big difference. And it's just by their nature, some of them have overhangs, some of them have cantilevers, uh, maybe step back you know, in a roof or something like that where the upper floor is less uh, than the lower floor. And we also see that most affordable housing is, is somewhere in the 20% more range. They're very compact. All right. They're, they tend to be cheaper buildings to build. So, um, you know, less corners, things like that. Most of the passive houses that we built have also been in this 20% range as well. And uh, that's done because of performance reasons, lower surface area, less heat can leak out. Um, and it makes it easier to hit those, um, those things, right? It's, it's simply a matter of, you know, if we, if we allow more opportunity for leak, heat to leak out, it will through that surface area. And how that plays out in real life. And it, as it turns out, surface area is more significant than insulation. So, um, you know, you can add tons and tons of insulation to a house, but surface area is still more significant. So we take two examples here, uh, you know, kind of a low surface area house and a high surface area house. And, and we throw all different, um, you know, options at it. And we have a system that does this automatically and, and we can throw all sorts of different, you know, scenarios at it and it'll spit out, um, you know, where all those different scenarios, uh, you know, kind of came in and how they interacted with each other and different combinations. So in this case, we did uh, 768 different options and all kind of realistic options, no passive host stuff. It's, it's all, um, you know, kind of, what regular builders would do. And what you'll see on the left hand side of this graph is that most of the options end up in step four. Uh, there's a whole bunch in step five, you know, with a few down in step three there. Uh, but most of them are in step four quite easily. Certainly it looks like there might be a lot of good options into step five if, uh, if we wanted to look at that. On the other side, on the right hand side there, you notice that most of the options are in step three with only a few. I believe there's only actually three that make it into step four at all. And keep in mind, the only difference here is surface area. These are the exact same options on the exact same floor size of house, same windows, same everything else. The only difference is surface area. And that is what you can see the dramatic shift in the graph, how easy it is for the low surface area house to meet the standard versus how hard or how much the other house struggles to meet um, step four as well. So, you know, if we can learn, learn something out of this is that if we're trying to make high step level houses cost effectively, simple forms, very low surface area is the way to get there effectively. The second piece that affects this uh, in quite dramatic fashion is the floor space. Now everything is measured per square meter of floor space. So that if we imagine that Teddy demand that we talked about earlier, what this means is that we're taking that Teddy and we're spreading it out evenly over the floor. 
And um, a lot of standards use this method because it's a way of comparing this house to that house in some somewhat equitable fashion. Uh, I mean, you could use volume or other, you know, different things, surface area, maybe too, but, but floor space is the most common one to use. And it, um, for a number of reasons, it has other uh, equity reasons to, to use floor space rather than measuring it against something else. So how that might play out in a house. So here's a simple house here. Um, you know, the actual Teddy ended up being 29. And in this climate zone where this house is, that's, that's enough to achieve, achieve step four. And that's assuming it has, you know, a full, full uh, floor upstairs and uh, no atriums or anything like that. If we went and put in an open to below, uh, you know, some sort of atrium or, you know, whatever in this house, we still have the same amount of heating load, right? We haven't changed our outside walls at all. So our house is still losing the same amount of heat. Our actual efficiency of the house has not changed, but the apparent efficiency has, because now we've got to take that heating load and we've got to stack it up over less floor space. When I'm modeling, I can't count an open to below as floor space because I can't stand up on it. I've got to be able to stand up and walk around on it. If you want me to catch it, count it as floor space. And so, um, you know, we've, although our actual efficiency of the house hasn't changed, the apparent has. And how that looks in that same house there, if we had, say, a half open loft in this house, that's enough to drop this house to step three. So if I have to make a prediction, if I'm going to predict the future of housing here, I think on the medium to economy end of the spectrum of housing, I think open to below as a feature is going to drift away. I mean, you don't see it that commonly anyways, but I think it's really going to drift away because of this, um, that it really, um, it really doesn't help you out on the, on the step code. The high-end houses, those folks that can do whatever they want, and you can always spend your way out of a problem. And so I'm not too worried about those folks, but, uh, but certainly on the, the economy end of the spectrum, I think open to below as a feature is something that's going to... Uh, going to drift away. So then, you know, here's an example house. Um, how does this house perform? Now this house, uh, you know, it, it's kind of an example of, um, you know, shooting yourself in the foot so many times that you run out of feet. Uh, it, uh, it's got a very high surface area. It's got a little bit of atrium going on in there. Um, it's got a very large amount of articulation. It's actually a bit of a U shape, um, you know, some big vaults, uh, different things like that. The basement is not the same size as the upper floor. So there's some overhangs and cantilevers and things like that. So, uh, you know, and a lot of the windows face north. Hopefully that's a obvious problem uh, for, for folks here. Um, so how does this house uh, model? Well, if we take those same sort of things, this house barely, uh, you know, can scrape by even halfway through step one. So, uh, you know, when we hear people talking about very expensive step code builds, this is usually what they're talking about. They're usually talking about houses like this. Very, very, very seldom do we ever see a inexpensive spec build or affordable housing type have any sort of this problem. It's usually the mansions that have um, problems like this. It's very, very seldom that we see, uh, we see that in the, you know, the value end of the spectrum or the, the economy end of the spectrum. So the solution to this house, you know, this house ended up with about, I believe it was about an $80,000 upgrade to get it up into uh, step three, which was the requirement of the local municipality there. And uh, so with normal kind of cheaper upgrades, couldn't do it. Uh, so they had to go to some pretty serious windows and, and stuff to do it. The other option is they could have changed their design. Um, that would have been an easy option to do uh, for them. The client didn't want to do that. Client had the money to spend. No problem. You can still do it as long as you've got the money to spend. And they really just, uh, they spent their way out of a problem is what they did. Which is a valid, valid solution uh, if you've got the money. You know, here's another example. This is actually a project I built um, and uh, it's in Victoria you know, the difference that shape makes, right? In this how this uh, building, it's basically a rectangle with the exception of those two dormers up there that have surface area that kind of goes up the side, over the top and down there. Um, they're just kind of regular dormers on there. And each one of those dormers is responsible for a, a subtraction of 5% of the performance. So if we had a building without those dormers on it, it'd be 10% more efficient uh, than uh, with the dormer. So, you know, any little shape does actually have quite a, uh, quite a big difference. And, um, you know, in this case, we put those on there because the community asked for them. The community was asking for, you know, dormers because they felt that all their houses had dormers true, which we all know isn't true, but, you know, it's the community. And by that time, you're so far through zoning, you just want to say, screw it, let's go, uh, let's get this down here. We don't, can't afford to spend any money waiting for zoning, so put them on and away we go. Um, you know, now knowing what we know now, 
um, we would have pushed back on that community a little bit more to say, like, look, this is a real uh, energy efficiency in implication. Are you sure that's what you're asking for? Is that really what you want? And actually, it was also caused us to lose net zero because we no longer had room on the roof for the solar panels. So some real implications of, uh, of having more eccentric shapes in, in buildings. Which then, of course, leads everybody to accuse me of saying, well, we should all live in ugly boxes. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I do enjoy a good box, but, um, you know, to, you know, they're easy to build, they're inexpensive, all sorts of reasons to do it. Uh, and, but here's two examples uh, that I would argue are not super ugly. I mean, the one on the left needs a paint job and it's sitting on like a jaunty angle and stuff. And the one on the right's missing its railing and things like that. But these are 150 year old houses. They're, they're actually in Lunenburg. They, they are right uh, about a block up from where the Blue Nose parks and uh, at the dock there. And these are some of the oldest houses in Canada. And if we model these houses using minimum code, uh, values, uh, construction techniques that we would use today, both of these houses are easily step three just using minimum code values. And the reason is because they're a very simple form. Uh, they're, you know, and they've, you know, these happen to have even windows on each side. That's not necessarily a requirement, but it just makes it so that you could face this house in any direction you wanted. Um, and it would be, uh, it would be a high performance housing and, and it's interesting that we're not actually looking at really futuristic technologies. Quite often we're looking back in time to see what they did then. And both of these houses would have been built by uh, poor fishermen uh, who had a low budget for building. They probably had a lot of kids that, that needed to be housed inexpensively. And they were also needed to be relatively efficient because they would have been heated by wood or by coal. And uh, that was expensive. And so they've got one single fireplace or, or you know, if they were uh, built a little later, maybe a, a furnace in the basement and it, you know, needed to be able to heat that uh, house relatively easily and, and uh, cost effectively. So it's the same kind of idea what we're talking about now. It's just 150 years old. So uh, certainly uh, it has been done before the, um, and can be done again. And they made like, especially the one on the left looks a lot more interesting because it's got a deck, it's got a screened in porch and all these different things. These, um, you know, these decorative things that aren't part of, uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, you know, of the house itself. Uh, I'm seeing a comment there that somebody lost, uh, just lost audio. I um, just want to confirm that, uh, uh, wait, so you can still hear me. Is it? Uh, yeah, Mark, I, I okay. cross check with him. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Good. Awesome. Oh, we just got a couple of comments here. I just uh, forward them to you. Um, sure. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll take a look and look at that. We've got a Q and A session right now. So, um, excellent. Um, yeah, and and so somebody asked if we could use if we could have used uh, fake dormers, and yeah, absolutely, you can. You can fake it. Um, that would uh, that would have worked definitely. Um, and what we say, I think the the rule of thumb there is decorating the envelope don't decorate with the envelope and uh, uh, and I think that's a kind of a key key kind of um, thing there that uh, you know if, if we kind of go with that mentality I think that can really help us out and I, I predict a, a bit of a renaissance in front porches and pergolas and things like that that'll make the outside of the building look not like a boxy box um, but a little more interesting and, and use that to kind of texturize our landscapes and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, oh, I see somebody else here, uh, actually liking a good, good box with a front porch. Gee, this is somebody trying to, trying to get, uh, get close to my heart there. That's for sure. I do enjoy a good box too, because they're, they're easy, you know, they're so easy to build. They're so inexpensive to build and they are higher performance buildings too. So, so that's great. I think I got them all there. Uh, yeah, it's all the ones I see there for now. Excellent. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to put absolute metrics aside for now, and I'm going to talk about uh, the um, uh, the percent better metrics. So these are the relative metrics, also known as the percent better metrics, and these are where we compare to something else. And there's two of these, right? And it can be an either or. Uh, you can use one of one and one of the other. It doesn't. You can mix and match a bit, so um, so they're not exclusive. You don't have to use all or one or all the other. So the, the first one I'll talk about is the percentage better for the envelopes. There's two, right? There's one for the envelope or the, the, the thermal, like the, you know, how hard your furnace is working. And the other one is for the, uh, for the mechanical energy or the total energy there. 
And so the theory behind this one is, is that if we took a standard two by six wall with R20 insulation in it, that comes out to about R15 effective. If we added uh, seven and a half inch or seven and a half uh, R's of insulation to the outside of that, like that would be like an inch and a half of rock wool or maybe some EPS or something like that, that would improve uh, the envelope by about 50%. And that's the theory that's, you know, if we get a 50% improvement, that's enough to get us to step five, get us our gold star. And uh, that's the theory behind um, this, uh, this metric. How this actually works in practice, and this is, I think, really important for us to understand. There's, a, there's kind of a key uh, separation here between this one and uh, the absolute metrics. And so if we take that house now, this is a scale model that I built of that, uh, that Lunenburg house there with even windows on each side. It's a little bit of a cube. Uh, if we take that house and we design it to be completely minimum code, uh, it comes out to be uh, about a little less, or a little more than 2% uh, worse than the reference house that we're comparing to. And that's about what you'd expect, right? It's a minimum code. It's pretty close to zero. Um, it wouldn't be better, better than the reference house. Uh, and that's what you'd expect. Uh, it has a heating load of uh, 25,800 megajoules uh, for that kind of base code house. If we take that house, uh, same house, and we add the inch and a half exterior insulation to it, it comes out as 51.9% better. So far, it looks great. Looks like the code is working, right? We got to uh, step five using it that way. We cut our heating load in half at about 12,000 megajoules. So everything looks like it's working out really great. And actually, if you took this cube house and uh, did this to it, it does also meet step five of the absolute metrics too. So everything kind of lines up really nicely. And actually, if you're, if you're building cubes, um, the, the relative metrics and the um, absolute metrics line up um, almost uh, exactly to it, it, as long as you're building cubes. The problem is very few of us built cubes. In fact, I've never built a cube. Built some rectangles, but never a cube. And this is what happens when we, uh, when we start messing around with the shape. So what I've done here is I've renovated the cube. I've taken one of the blocks and I've put it on the, on the side. It's a very common sort of setup that you'd see smaller upper floor, bigger lower floor, um, same windows, uh, same construction. And we've kept that inch and a half uh, uh, of, um, of insulation on there still. So it's still showing up as 50% better. So we still got our step five gold star on this one. But look at what's happened to our heating load. Our heating load has actually gone up by 22%. And um, that's pretty significant. That, that is enough to make it fail the absolute metrics, but we're still okay on the relative metrics. And 22%, uh, you know, I'm also a bit of an electric car nerd. And so for you, those of you that, uh, you know, know electric cars there, that's enough to drive my electric car from Victoria to Thunder Bay, Ontario uh, every year. That's a fair, fair amount of power um, to get my car most of the way across the country on uh, on that number of megajoules or at least the 22 percent uh, increase in heating load there and that happens every year it's a it's a per year thing so it's a fair bit of energy difference in taking that shape and all we're doing is taking and changing that shape so uh, what's important to understand about this metric is that you're not necessarily saving energy so your house may actually use more energy um, than a simpler form but you're comparing to a reference house um, and how that looks if we graph that out so we start with our minimum code cube. Everything looks the same. Looks like it matches up. We add our 50% to it. Everything still matches up. And then as soon as we start adding surface area to, we start going up in that more, uh, you know, uh, those more articulated buildings. We start adding the overhangs and, and different things. We start seeing a spreading of, uh, of the reference house relative to the actual house. And what's happening is the reference house that we're comparing to is getting worse faster than our actual house as we add surface area. So the more surface area you add, the easier time you will have of meeting this metric. And then of course we do often see houses like this. I'm stopping at 150% more surface area than a cube um, on, on that graph there, but we do routinely see you know, pretty extravagant houses like this that are, that are way beyond that. So these houses would actually have a very, very easy time hitting the percentage better metric, um, actually almost a free pass uh, versus something that was more compact. They would have a real hard time hitting the, the percent better metric. So I'll leave that one. That was the envelope one. And now for the one that is either or to the MUI uh, and uh, or also, you know, if you're thinking about it as total energy, that's that's fine too. Uh, so this one is the percent better than the Energuide reference house or the percent better than reference house. It's important to understand what the reference house is. So now we're comparing the total energy, right? And, and so this one is slightly different than the envelope. 
and the reference house is really uh, the simplest terms is it, it's a fairy tale house. It doesn't um, it doesn't exist. Uh, it's a it's something that is auto created by our energy model, and it is a house that has the same surface area as your house, built to minimum code, and it redistributes the windows. Has a similar type of mechanical system, and an air tightness of uh, two point five. If you're looking at your energy guide label, that's this house underneath. It's the it's the air. It's the one underneath there, and it it says a typical new house. That that's really kind of false advertising, in my opinion, because it's really not a typical new house. It's um in in a lot of cases you wouldn't be able to actually build this house because of the way it distributes the the windows. Um, so, but it it's it yeah, it's trying to give you a comparison to you know what your neighbor's house might do, but it's it's in reality that's that's not really what it's saying. And one of those reasons is, as to why it's not actually what it's doing is, is this. So if we imagine a subdivision with three houses there and, and you know, maybe there's a cul-de-sac on the north and south. Uh, you've got windows on the north because the road is there or the view is there. Windows on the south because on that side, that's where the view is. That's where you'd put the windows. The reference house would redistribute these windows and it would take one of those north facing windows and put it on the south, one of those south facing windows and put it on the north. So the north facing house would actually look very poor next to its reference house because the reference house has a southern facing window on it, which is get free energy. The southern facing house has the opposite effect because its reference house now has a north facing window that's just losing energy. Um, it's going to look really great next to its reference house. So we could have two exactly the same houses, just mirror images of each other, appearing to perform very differently against a reference house. Um, and uh, and that's, you know, otherwise they have the exact same upgrades, exact same thing, but they appear very different. So it's something we definitely would coach our clients to watch out for. And one of the reasons building subdivisions why we don't, we tend not to use the reference house approach as a metric because of uh, this sort of thing. The house in the middle might be a wash. It could go either way uh, because, you know, it would distribute some of its uh, windows to the middle there. And of course, you're not going to, in reality, you're not, you wouldn't be allowed to build that house because of the fire code, uh, you know, options there. So it's not really comparing to a, a, co a house that you could actually build. You know, if we go back to this, uh, this complex house, this, this house again, wouldn't actually do very well on this metric either, even though it's got a lot of surface area because of the window issue, most of its windows face the north. And so it's shot itself in the foot there again, um, and is going to have a problem. Now, if we took this house and we flipped it around and said, the view was now in the south. Um, completely different story. This house may overheat like crazy because it's got this wall of glass to the south, but it's going to have so much free energy from the sun that it may look very good next to its reference house. So all sorts of uh, games to be played there with that one. If I can pull those two things together and kind of put them into one summary here. If, if we're looking at the kind of our spectrum of housing, very simple housing to more complex and, and you know, uh, more, uh, more articulated housing. If I'm designing for the absolute metrics, I'm going to design as close as I can to that square. Uh, you know, I'm going to put maybe slightly more windows on the south, although no curtain walls, nothing too crazy. And physics really matters in this case. It really ma actually matters how much energy you're actually using. The lower, the better. Um, and uh, so absolute metrics, simpler form, the better. The easier it'll be, the more affordable it'll be. The exact opposite is true if you're trying to go for the relative metrics. So if you're building some high end mansion or something, you may just want to ignore the absolute metrics and just look at the percent better uh, metrics, assuming you don't have a view to the north with a curtain wall there. In this case, the physics actually don't really matter because you're not actually looking to reduce energy. All you're looking to do is beat the reference house. And that doesn't necessarily mean you've reduced your energy load. You've just beaten the reference house. And, you know, it's like that old saying, right? If you're, you know, if, if you see a bear in the woods, you don't have to be the fastest runner. You just have to be faster than the slowest guy. So, um, you know, it's the same thing with the reference house. And there's another, there's other kind of quirks there too, like using a gas boiler rather than a furnace, because the minimum code for gas boiler is a lot lower performing than the relative minimum code of a furnace. So there's some other games we can play there too. But that's kind of, if you, if you take one thing away as a designer or as a builder from this section, Take this slide away. If we want to design affordably absolute, simple forms. If we want to design for, you know, for uh, relative metrics, the more, uh, you know, the more complex form, the better. So I'll just take a quick look at my uh, 
uh, slides here, the questions here. So someone's asking uh, about uh, how do we feel about functional shutters? Um, good question. It's actually, you know, if I was doing a, a passive host, I would take that into account for the energy model. Uh, we do account for that sort of thing. But uh, in the Energuide, uh, uh, you know, scenario there, our model is a bit simplified and we don't have the ability to properly account for things like shutters. We do account for some shading, uh, which would help overheating and things like that. Um, you know, which I think would be a great idea if, you know, on a lot of those houses that are having overheating issues where they've got, you know, maybe a bit too much glazing to the south. Um, and they can also even help on the north side where they're trapping air there and, and keeping things warm. So I like functional shutters as a feature, but it's not something that would necessarily be accounted for in your normal part nine um, modeling, uh, modeling approach. But, you know, good question there for sure. So that brings us to air leakage. This is that third piece. Now we've talked about the total energy and the mechanical energy. Uh, we've talked about the envelopes, the two metrics that can be either or here. And the last one is the air leakage. And a lot of builders, uh, if you haven't been paying attention now, because a lot of that other stuff is really a lot of design stuff. If you haven't been paying attention so far, this is really where you've got to start paying attention because um, this is largely under the control of the builder. The designers can make it easier for you by giving you a simple shape and good details and things like that. But this is really down to the diligence of the build team. Now, you know, if, if some of you are, are testing, I, I'm, I'm interested to hear what, uh, what people have gotten for, you know, various different uh, records and stuff in, in the local area. On, um, on Vancouver Island, the, the best I've ever tested is a 0.16, um, and uh, that's, that's pretty low for, for ACH, and, and the average of builders that have not tested before is about 3.5. So if you've never tested before, about 3.5 is, is, you know, probably where you are if you're doing like a reasonable job. And what do I mean by 3.5? I mean, that's 3.5 air changes per hour. And one air change per hour is one air change of this room leaking out once per hour. So that would be one. If all the air in this room leaked out once per hour, that would be one air change. And 50 pascals is the pressure difference across the envelope. And 50 pascals is actually a natural condition. On a windy day, you would easily get 50 pascals. Um, and that's from the, the wind sucking on the envelope or pushing on it, or, or maybe the building being hotter than the outside, it would push on it by that much. So it's a natural condition that we're actually simulating. It's not you know, some you know, unusual thing. And, and, and 50 pascals is actually not that much. Your ears don't pop when we turn on the fans, um, unless you've got some sort of you know, condition there. Um, you'll, you'll find that the pressure difference of 50 pascals when we turn on our fans is less than going to the top of the ski hill. So it's not a lot of pressure, but it's an artificially created kind of environment so we can, we can measure. So why does this matter so much? Why do EAs get so uptight about uh, air tightness and air leakage? Well, the simple, simple definition here is that if we've got a, a house with four ACH, four air changes, four times the volume of this room is leaking out once per hour, versus one. Well, that one with four times per hour has to reheat that air four times per hour. And it's just a huge amount of fuel use to go four times per hour versus one. And so at step five, the air leakage rate is one. At step three, it's 2.5. So two and a half times the air is leaking out at step three versus at step five. So it's quite a big difference in terms of how much reheating of air your building needs to do. And you know, here's here's some examples of just kind of things gone uh, gone wrong, um, and and for builders, it's really a matter of supervising your trades and doing your quality control. On the left hand side here, somebody in doing the framing had the the foresight to pre strip uh, a vapor air barrier there, but then they messed it up by putting um, you know by not cutting off their stair ledger and uh, just running it long. So there's now no way we can seal around. That. And these are the sorts of little things that get us. It's not the pinholes, it's not the staple holes, it's not, um, you know, that kind of stuff. It's usually this stuff that we just didn't think about. And builders on their first test, it's, it's usually they're looking at it and they see the leak and they say, oh, I didn't even think about that. And that's the stuff that's getting it. Whatever that stuff is, you know, it's around a pipe, it's around this, or it's, you know, in this maybe hard to reach area. It's not the really complicated stuff um, that that's really tripping people up. And if you're building houses like on the left-hand side or the right-hand side there, I, I like to show this picture just because it's so silly. It was one of the worst jobs we've ever tested. Not the worst job we've ever tested, but um, that's what an 11 ACH looks like in a brand new house. So that's what we call a mega fail. 
Um, and uh, they had some definitely some remedial work to do on uh, on that house. And what they've done is they've just smeared it everywhere. It's just a really nasty, uh, not neat job and uh, really a waste of time and money on that one. The other thing we see a lot of um, is the use of spray foam. And there, I want to throw some caution here with this. There's a, you know, there's a sense among some builders that spray foam is a fix all and it's going to solve all of our problems. And, and now there's a time and a place for spray foam. Um, certainly it can be a useful product from time to time, uh, but it is not going to fix all the problems. We still need to pay attention to the details. And here's two examples of where it really went wrong and we had a mega fail uh, with, these, uh, with the spray foam here. So on the, the one on the left, um, you can see there's a number of problems. The, the wire running into, into that wall, it, the wire hasn't been moved at all, but it's already cracked off of that insulation. So that's not an air seal. And in the joint between the floor and the, the ply there, there's, you know, the, the installer just didn't, um, didn't put enough foam in there and it all sagged back and there's now a, a still a big leak there. In addition to that, this floor system, because it's got the doubled up um, two by material, there's a leak between those two by materials. So this is not an appropriate air barrier for this floor system because it, it cannot seal it. You know, a much cheaper way to do this would have been to just put some bats in there and then run, you know, either poly or some other, uh, air barrier just on the bottom um, and it, you know would have been significantly cheaper and uh, provided a better air barrier in this case. On the right hand side there, this is one that's been taken out. Um, they had a, a failure of a number of things there and, and you can see that the spray foam has not stuck to a bunch of the wood, which means it's not being an air barrier. Um, and, uh, and I don't know whether that was installation or, or some other problem, but, but we see this regularly. When we come into houses that have really large amounts of spray foam in them. Um, we, our, our team has, has started betting against these houses uh, because we are seeing a real pattern between large amounts of spray foam and large failures. And I, I don't know whether it's the foam doing it or it's the installer or it's, an, it's a combination of things. I suspect it's because the builders have viewed this as a fix-all that we don't need to pay attention to the details anymore. And we do definitely need to pay attention to the details, kind of no matter what product we're using. No matter how many times the salesman assures us that it's, it's going to be super amazing and, and totally save our lives. So I'm going to leave um, a step code behind a bit and I'm going to get into a case study here. But if, if there was a textbook for this, uh, this course, these, these two things would be it here. And they are available at energystepcode.ca, along with a bunch of other resources, actually. There's a lot of really good resources there um, for industry, for, uh, for all sorts of things. There is a builder guide and there's a designer guide. The builder guide is primarily part nine and has a lot of great pictures. If you're a picture person, there's a lot of great pictures of different types of insulation details, air barrier, all the kind of the principles that I've talked about here about shape um, and, and all that sort of stuff are in this guide. Um, and uh, really good, uh, useful guide. You can download it at energystepcode.ca. The designer guide, why they put it in landscape, I have no idea. I guess it's because designers read sideways and not like you know normal people, but it's primarily, um, part three. And again, it has all the kind of principles that I've, I've talked about here, but it is primarily part three. So if you're working in part three, that's a good one for you. Um, I would recommend that everybody read both of them because there, there are some good lessons, I think, in both of them. They both have great pictures in them too um, and, uh, and are well worth a read. So, uh, so if you want to follow up or, or maybe didn't quite get something uh, that I've uh, chattered on about here, um, give those, um, give those two uh, documents a look. Um, they're, they're worth a read there and they're available online. So I think we'll take a pause here for questions before we get into uh, into the the case study here. So record for uh, passive house in Vancouver was a 0.14. Yeah, nice. That's pretty solid, and it would be probably a passive house where they're trying to trying to get uh, uh, all the way in there. So 0.14, pretty tight. I, I you know I've heard from time to time every now and then somebody is on Instagram or somewhere with a number that is 0 0.0 something like a 0, 0.0 something or rather. And um, everybody in this course has has perm my permission. You can say I said so, um, that you can totally call um, you know uh, BS on that. That's that can't be true if it's a point zero something because our equipment can't test that accurately. You'd have to do that in a lab, and it, unless you're taking your building to a lab, um, then uh, then the point zero something isn't true. Uh, but point one four that's um, that's pretty amazing. That is super tight. That. Uh, 
uh, that's that's getting uh, that's getting really up there. They clearly did a good job on that. And and now the other thing on, on that I think is is worth noting is 0.14 is still like a lot of people were, might refer to that as like a hermetic seal. That that's not true, right? If we if we have you know 0.14, that's still 14% of the air in this room leaking out once per hour. It's still a fair bit of air. Um, so you're not going to suffocate if you uh, are in that room for for whatever reason. So. Um, moving on to the, our, my case study here. So a little bit of background on this, this, uh, this case study, um, and why we call it, uh, how to do it for free, because I, I've been teaching this course and, and doing it around the province for, for a while. And back in the day when we could travel and do it in person, inevitably, you know, I'd be talking about how affordable, you know, this performance stuff is and how it's not too hard and all that sort of stuff. And somebody, usually a spec builder would put up their hand and say, that's easy for you to say, you build net zero houses and you've got $2 million budgets on the Vancouver Island and whatever. And, and that's, that's actually a bit of a valid criticism. Uh, most of the passive houses and the net zeros that we've built have been spec houses, but they're really custom specs. They're not like proper spec houses. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm the type of guy that says, well, okay, if you're going to call me out on that, I'm going to go put my money where my mouth is and try and prove you wrong. So uh, we've so far spent about 900 grand doing this and, uh, you know, proving people wrong doing it and, and we're having a great time doing it. And uh, um, actually it's been quite profitable. So happy to have people call me, call me out on this uh, as many times as they want. Um, and so what we did with this project is because my team is not set up for spec building, they're not, you know, they want to add all sorts of fancy HRVs to things and triple pane windows. We're not set up for it. We went and we sought out a builder that was doing good quality uh, spec houses and had already practiced their air tightness a little bit. So we found, we found that we also needed a place where I could actually afford land, which is Courtney. I can't afford land in, in, uh, in Victoria, it's just ridiculously too expensive. So we went to Courtney and we found a builder there. We also picked a designer that was doing minimum code style designs and uh, kind of production style design. So we had like the whole package. We had, you know, production builder, uh, production designer, all in one package to get as close as we could to like a proper spec house that, um, that anybody was sort of, you know, building. And the first thing we did in that is say, we are not going to use the percent better metrics. That was the first one of the first things we did. We are not targeting those because in order to do that, you have to add something to the house. You have to add insulation to it or something in order to qualify for that metric. And that just sounds like money spending to me. Everybody knows you add a bit of insulation, you're going to spend more money. So those were out. So we went to the absolute metrics. We designed for the absolute metrics. Second thing we did was we did a fair bit of integrated design. And what I mean by that, um, you know, a lot of the designers hopefully are familiar with this, but we actually went to the plumber instead of just saying, give us a quote, we said, what do you think? What would be the most affordable way for you to do your work in this building? And we got their feedback and we made changes on their feedback. Same thing with the window guy, same thing with the electrician. And uh, we took all those notes and we put them back into the design. And that uh, helps a lot. I mean, it's, it sounds silly, but, you know, we call it cooperation for builders. It's a bit of Sesame Street stuff, but very uh, few builders we find actually do this other than just send a quote and say, build this. And, and you know, quite often our trades are very smart people and, and can give us good advice. So this is what it came up with. This is the, what the case study house looks like uh, from the front on the plans. In this neighborhood, it's a very, you know, normal looking house. All the houses basically look like this. Um, it, it does not stick out um, on the on the street. This is what it looked like a couple of weeks ago. They actually, I was just actually there yesterday, but I I didn't uh, didn't manage to get my updated photo into uh, into the slideshow here. It, it is framed now. Um, it uh, it does have um, its roof on as well, so it is actually a a real house now. Uh, it should be finished in a, in about a month or two. And you can see down the street, like this is a pretty pretty typical BC subdivision, right? There's nothing unusual um, about it. Although the neighbor's house does have some solar panels on it, um, this is this is not unusual. And this particular builder has built um, about half the uh, houses in this subdivision. So we have a really good kind of little bit of a laboratory here where we know what all the other buildings would cost. We have the air tightness measurements on all of them, and uh, so we can really very well compare to this house. So where does it actually land? Well, the requirements are there. And if, uh, if we plot this on our little graph here, it does land into step five. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, how did we, how did we get there? Right. How did we, how did we make that happen? Well, the first lesson, I mean, this is the, one of the first lessons I talked about in this class, right? It's, it's a square, right? You don't, doesn't get much more square than that. 
there is a little bit of a bump in the front and that was done for zoning. The zoning requirement here required some articulation in the front. One of the builders in the last class I taught had a really good point that we could have just furred that out on the front. We could have faked it and, and just furred it out and we wouldn't have had to do that. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. It's a very small bump um, and, uh, and we can get away with it and still be, still be pretty cost effective. The windows, no curtain walls to the south. Um, you know, the, there is more windows on the south than on the north, but not uh, hugely so. And the north windows are actually still, you know, a pretty decent size. Um, there's still egress windows for those bedrooms. And, uh, you know, it's not like there are these tiny little portholes or anything. Uh, we just have more windows on the south, but not a ton more. If we were to take this house and flip it around because it was on the other side of the street, it still works. Um, it drops to step four if we just did it as is. But if we reduce the windows on the south by 10% and increase the windows on the north by 10%, then we're back to step five. So it's, it's actually pretty flexible. In the basement, it has a legal secondary suite with a crawl space. Um, and uh, the crawl space is important here because, um, you know, not only is it useful for storage and, and whatnot, but um, we can actually count that as floor space. In this case, it's a deep enough crawl space to be counted as floor space, uh, rather than if it was a slab on grade, we wouldn't get that extra floor space. And if you recall our earlier conversation about open to belows, this is sort of a, the opposite effect of that. The garage um, now is set in the middle because of where the driveway lines up. And actually, this isn't an ideal location for it. Better would be if we took the stairs and switched where the stairs are with the garage there, because then, you know, we'd only have two surface areas of garage rather than the current three. And uh, that would actually make a, a decent difference. But we get away with it. We're still step five. And it, it kind of shows you that you don't have to be perfect um, to still do it. Um, it's just, you know, things you can do to kind of help yourself out here. And, and so we get away with the garage being where it is. It's, uh, it's not ideal, but it's not the end of the world. So how we actually built this thing, let's look at some of the specs. Now it, it does have an ICF foundation and um, some builders have disputed uh, with me whether this is cheaper or not, but for my team, ICF has always been cheaper without the stripping and all that sort of stuff. ICF has always been cheaper for us. And it, you know, if that's not the case for your build team, what this is, is an R20 foundation. So if you framed in and put R20 in the walls, th that would work. This is an R20 foundation. So if, you know, you could change that up if you wanted. But for us, ICF is actually the cheaper option. The windows are a U1.5 window, uh, which is a, a pretty um, normal production grade window. Uh, all the other builders in this neighborhood and in, you know, this, this builder before we started uh, messing around with their, uh, their life here, um, they were all using this window. This is a, like a Starline 6000 window, Apply Gem, Milgard makes a window like this. This is a production grade window. This is nothing fancy. It is not triple pane. Um, it is a regular uh, vinyl slider. The roof uh, is an R40 bat truss um, and, uh, you know, again, completely normal. Everybody else in the neighborhood's doing this thing. What we have on there, uh, in addition, is a two by two fur down. Uh, so it's just a two by two on flat. It's actually the scrap lumber from, you know, doing other stuff that's just nailed up on flat uh, on this roof. The reason we've done that is because then all the electrical can be below the air barrier. So we pre-strip pre all the, like the air barrier gets run above um, the poly and then everything electrical is below. So we don't have to use boots. So we save a bit of time, uh, a fair bit of time not using boots. And, um, and we've designed without pot lights, we've got other alternative lights and, and different things like that. Uh, so we're not into that air barrier with our, uh, with our pot lights and electrical. So in all that, that usually costs us for building about this size, a little under a thousand dollars. We could call it a thousand dollars in round numbers. And somebody's gonna jump in the chat now saying, you said this was free and that is thousand dollars is not free, but I'll, I'll get to that. I'll come back to that. So we'll keep that number in your mind that we've, we've just spent a thousand dollars extra. So the, the walls are a two by six at 24 and center with an R22 bat. And now 24 on center is something pretty standard in this neighborhood. Um, I certainly encourage everybody to do it. Lumber's too expensive anyways. You might as well go two, two foot on center if your engineers will let you get away with it. The R22 bat is also standard in this neighborhood. So I wouldn't call this a minimum code house. I would call this a standard practice house. Not a best practice house, but standard practice. And, uh, and so R22 is, is standard practice in this neighborhood. I think you'd have a hard time selling a house in this neighborhood if you didn't have R22 because all the other houses do. 
And then we went R12 under the slab. Now this is not a heated slab, so we do not need insulation under the slab. And so, uh, you know, Bill is again saying, hey, you put an upgrade in there and you said this was free. So when we price this particular upgrade out, um, we come up with, you know, with labor and, and stuff, it's about $2,000 to put the R12 under the full slab here. And we bulk order insulation from the plant. So it's pretty, pretty cheap. Usually um, this is not an expensive upgrade. Uh, and it's, of course, it's like a first year apprentice to go plunk this stuff down, um, but we don't need it. So it is an upgrade. Um, and, uh, and so now with our, our fur down and our, our insulation there, we're up to about $3,000 in, uh, in extra spend on this house. So hold, hold that number in your mind there for a second. The last thing that we've done here is we're targeting an ACH or an air change per hour of 0 0.8. Now, step five is one, right? So we're a little lower than step five. And that sounds ambitious that can, uh, you know, that might sound like a long shot to a lot of folks, but the builder we've chosen, it, it's Coastal Customs out of, um, out of Courtney there. They've been practicing for a while and they know how to do this. And they, um, they've done 0.8 before they've, uh, and they'll, you know, they've done it with traditional techniques. It's, it's poly, it's Tyvek, it's, you know, things like that. They're not using any space age technology, not expensive tapes. And it's because they practiced it. So they've done a few homes, they've tested them. They had their teams there during the test to see where the leaks were and they can hit 0.8 very reliably. And what we're finding is that they're spending less time worrying about it and spending less money hitting 0.8 now than they were you know trying to do what they were doing even before we started testing so um so this is really not an expensive thing um it is a practice thing and i think any builder can do that uh with uh with some practice and it's really that's that's the key there's the practice and you know if you wanted to say this costs a little extra because you got to send your you know your first your second year apprentice around to go check the tapes or whatever for a day if you want to throw another 500 bucks on the budget for that i'm i'm okay with that so that gets us to this, you know, okay, so we've, we've got say, you know, maximum about 3,500 bucks um, on this, uh, uh, you know, on this house, you know, but what else do we have, right? Everything else is pretty much the same, right? The, the, the walls are, or the paint is the paint, the siding is the siding, that's all the same, you know, uh, the shingles are the singles, uh, cabinets are, doesn't matter. So everything else is, is basically the same. So I want to, I want to go back to this then, the, the design and you know, this is where I get to claim that this house is actually uh, is actually cheaper. In version one, when we went to this designer, who's our you know a, you know really popular designer in town, they do a lot of the spec homes in town. I said to them, "Give me the boxiest box that you've ever boxed before, and draw that on a plan, and that's what we want to build." And so they gave us version one, and this was their version of a really super boxy house, um, you know, low surface area house. And it, you know, if I had been like a your regular sort of guy that's motivated by, you know, traditional, you know, building and stuff like that. I, I might have taken that house and, and built it and be very happy with it. But I'm motivated by following the model. And so the model says we need lower surface area. And so that led us to version three, which of course is, is much more square. And if you look at the difference in those two envelope areas, well, it's it's 14 extra linear square feet, linear feet um, times two floors. That's an extra 252 uh, square feet less of envelope. So we've got a whole lot less envelope here. It's 252 square feet less just by changing the shape uh, in that much. And, and, you know, just pretty easy design changes at that stage. And so what that works out to, if we, if we do the math on that, for my company, the square footage cost of an envelope from like paint to siding is somewhere around 50 to $70 a square foot. You guys can do the math on your own, you know, whatever it happens to be for you, depending on what you're doing for the siding. And that works out to somewhere between $12,000 and $17,000 in savings. And so, you know, we had say $3,500-ish extra spend on the house itself. Um, and we came out with, you know, over $10,000 in savings. And that's what we're seeing actually in the data for this, uh, this neighborhood now is we know what the other houses cost. Uh, we know what this house is costing. We're, this house, even though it's step five, is actually ending up being about $10,000 cheaper at least than all the houses around it. So, you know, if I'm a developer, that's, that's good developer math all day long. I've got a step five house. I'm $10,000 cheaper. Holy moly. This is a, this is a good run. And actually uh, there have now been a couple more permits filed with this exact same design in that, in that house, because uh, everybody wants the, the $10,000 cheaper for a step five house. And um, you know, on the sales side of things, so this house will be for sale. Um, I offered to buy it if the, you know, if the developer didn't think he could sell it. Um, so he had a guaranteed sale price uh, to do this kind of crazy thing. But, um, 
but uh, the offers and stuff that are coming in on this house are higher than the houses next door because of that step five label, that energy efficient label. So we're getting better marketing. Uh, it was cheaper to begin build to begin with. Uh, you know, this is a no brainer. I mean, this, there's, um, there's lots of extra money to be made by doing the performance, um, which, uh, and it always, so it always kind of boggles my mind when developers say, oh, it's not worth it. Nobody wants to pay for it because that is simply not the case. We have definitely seen people really eager uh, to pay for this and uh, in fact, lining up for it. So, you know, that's, that's all, all well and good. And then the, the last piece that I haven't talked about is the mechanical systems on, uh, on these houses. And the, the reason I haven't really talked about them is because they're not an afterthought, but they are designed last. We design the house and then we pick the, the system based on the house. We don't use rules of thumbs. We actually do the math on it. So our, our team does the heat, heat load calculations and things for, for houses. And you'll often, you know, if you're working with us, you'll often see us, you know, kick out a thing that says, well, the, the, the specification for the heating is too big or it's, you know, it should be this or whatever, it, you know, adjust it. And then quite often that'll save a bunch of money and actually a lot of callbacks and headaches for, for the contractor as well. Um, but, you know, every EA, if they're doing the modeling, has a, at least a vague size of what the heating should be. And uh, so definitely you can ask your, your EA about it. And on the actual system, in this case, because our house is very efficient, we could choose any one of the options. But, um, you know, because we have our total energy isn't, um, isn't pushing the envelope, we've got lots of room there. This house is going to go with a, a heat pump because that was, you know, the best cost to run and actually the install cost was, was pretty cost effective there as well. Um, we could have used a gas system if we wanted to, but, um, uh, but, it, but the, it was more cost effective to go with the heat pump in this case. And, and in this neighborhood, heat pumps are more common. So uh, that was a sale, uh, a sale issue as well. So then the question becomes, will it work in other areas, right? Can we do this in other areas or just, you know, the Vancouver Island where it's the Canadian Riviera, right? Well, if I, you know, if I move this house to Victoria, well, obviously it still works. That's, you know, pretty warm, right? Um, but what about, you know, a place like Quinell that's uh, super north and, uh, you know, near Prince George there. And as it turns out, if I take the same house and I just plunk it down in Quinell, it, it's still step four, you know, pretty good. This is, you know, a, a Victoria house in Quinell, um, you know, step four is pretty good for not spending any money. And, and this is not really a great comparison because um, in Quinell, they don't use R22 insulation. They use R24 as their kind of minimum standard. They also use better windows uh, because it's cold. The clients wouldn't buy it if they didn't uh, and a few other things too. So uh, if we went to, you know, this is a standard practice Vancouver Island house. If we took it to a standard practice Quinell house, we end up there. Um, still not quite step five, uh, uh, you know, but, but pretty darn close. And if you remember back to one of the very first slides I had, we're looking at step five for 2032, right? That's still a long ways away. So we've got a lot of years to figure out how to make that little jump, uh, all the way to step five and figure out, you know, by that time, we're going to have innovation and technology. We're going to have, you know, probably everybody's going to be practicing their skills a lot and it'd be a lot easier to, uh, to get us there. Um, and, and I, I suspect we'll be, we'll be talking about, uh, step five for free, even in those Northern areas. And certainly we can already do it in the Southern areas where, where most of us are from. So, um, you know, uh, look forward to the future on that one. And we'll take a pause for, uh, for questions. And then we're, we're just about exactly on time. We might have, uh, we might have a bit of time for our, uh, our hall of shame, uh, photos here, but, um, but I think, uh, has got a, a few, uh, a few statements at the end here too. So I'll just take a bit of time to do some questions and, and see, uh, see what we end up with here. Make sure everybody gets home by, by five o'clock. Um, yeah, so, uh, so actually, uh, yeah, Kevin is, is making a note here of uh, the Canadian wood council has an effective, uh, calculator that incorporates a hundred possibilities of assemblies and double studs and all sorts of different things. Uh, that's actually a really good point. That is uh, a good um, a, a good resource. So that's the Canadian Wood Council. I'm sure you can Google them. They do have a number of books out as well that kind of show a lot of good options. Um, and uh, so if you know if your EA is sending back saying, "Oh, we got to improve a little bit," and you want to look at really good secure options, there's a lot of really good resources out there. BC Housing has a number of textbooks out there as well um, with higher R values if you needed that as well as um, uh, the, the calculator from, uh, from uh, the Canadian Wood Council as well. Um, and I actually, Kevin's just sent us a link there. So I'm going to copy that link and uh, 
and uh, yeah, yeah, just, yeah, you just post that. it. Yeah, good. Every, so everybody can get it there as well. I think good resources. There's lots of great resources out there. Um, and uh, look for, yeah, happy to happy to see those sorts of things included there. Um, uh, did, yeah, so question uh, if uh, the model in Quidel included the adjusted Teddy. Yes, it did. Yeah, so that was an adjusted Teddy. We typically only use the adjusted Teddy, and that's the one that's adjusted for your climate zone. We typically don't use the other one anymore. It's just kind of become obsolete. So um, it does uh, adjust. That's why the target zone is, is so much bigger for Quidel. Um, uh, yeah, so... Um, Someone is asking about uh, the, the the efficiency of heat pumps at lower temperatures, and the consumption goes way up in, in cold weather conditions. That that is true, um, and that's a really good point. So yes, heat pump efficiency does drop with colder temperatures. But the interesting thing of what we find is that if you're buying even a halfway decent heat pump these days, um, in our climate zone here, in climate zone four, in the southern part of climate zone five, um, the heat pumps are still often not all the time but often your better option for running cost and that's because their average cop or the coefficient of production is over two throughout the year so you may see it in their advertisements a cop of three and a half or something like that but by the time you get some cold weather that average is actually somewhere a little lower than that and there is a fuzzy line somewhere midway through climate zone five where it is, you know, that balance tips and, and where the balance tips to maybe to a different type of fuel like gas or something where it might be cheaper to run gas. But as technology improves and heat pump costs come down, that fuzzy line slowly moves north. And I'm sure 10 years ago, that line was probably, you know, only Victoria. And now it's moved north to be midway through climate zone five. We did one in Revelstoke uh, just the other day. And it was actually more cost effective to run a decent quality heat pump than it was uh, to uh, to do gas in that case. And um, you know, if we had gone a little bit further north, um, that might that math might have flipped uh, flipped back the other way. So I think it's in something important to check. Um, you know, the, a lot of the old rules of thumbs of you know because gas is such a fuel a cheap fuel, uh, you know um, that doesn't necessarily apply. So it's important for us to check and do the math and decide what is the best heating system for this house and this client uh, you know there you know i'm not saying one is better than the other there could be all sorts of different reasons why you would choose gas even though you might have a heat pump as well and maybe you're doing a hybrid system there's all sorts of reasons why that but it's important that we choose the right system for the house and we don't base it on you know the old wives tales or the old rules of thumbs we actually do the math on on it and give our client something that has is actually based on something it's not just you know because that's what we saw on tv that one time or that's what my old supervisor told me um oh and i uh, i see somebody recently passed uh an ea exam so congratulations on that that's not a not an easy exam uh to pass look uh, look forward to seeing you in the industry um and the the question is do you have any um suggestions for EAs entering new EAs entering the market and yeah actually so that's that's something um new EAs that maybe aren't quite as experienced yet um you know I think uh first of all find yourself a mentor um it's something we've done a lot of um you know feel free to reach out um we don't work in your area so uh, or at least not in the the Abbotsford area so we're not your competitor and 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 we uh we love to talk shop and and help people out the second thing I, I would do is join your local home builders association. And, and that definitely goes for any builders or designers on the call as well. I got to give a plug for CHBA here because that's where you will find your, you know, if you're an EA, that's where you will find your clients um, going and, and going to their events and, you know, and, you know, maybe volunteer a bit of your time to be on a committee or something like that. And you will get, um, you know, if you put in your time, you will get 10 times out of it, um, both in clients. Most of our business comes from uh, other CHBA uh, builders and clients. And it's, you know, it's, um, it's, it's not only because we, you know, we, we volunteer for stuff, but we show up for events and we, we talk to people and, and we, you know, we market through a network. Those repeat clients are going to be your, um, your bread and butter. And, and it's a great place to meet the other EAs too. There's a lot of other EAs there and, you know, mentorship and, and uh, teaming up and, and forming alliances and stuff is that's, that's really the place to do it. Uh, for EAs, there's also Casey, which is the Society of en Consulting Energy Advisors. Um, and, uh, and that's the, the Energy Advisor Association, which again, a great resource for new EAs to learn things, take courses and, and uh, do things, uh, do things like that. Um, 
Another question from uh, from Chad is uh, is electrifying all your systems the right way to go? Well, you know, good question, um, and I'm going to give you a waff waffly answer. The answer is it depends. Um, in a lot of cases, yeah, I think it probably is the right way to go. Um, in, in, in other cases, there could be any number of reasons why that's maybe not the the right way to go. Certainly, in those northern climates where heat pumps maybe don't uh, don't perform as well, you might want to look at a hybrid system um, where it has a heat pump with a gas backup or something like that. Uh, you know, um, you know. So it really depends on the project um, and depends on what you're counting. Um, if you're counting carbon. Electricity is going to win unless you're using renewable natural gas or something like that, which is an option in our market. We can get renewable natural gas from Fortis. So, um, you know, there's all sorts of depends. Uh, you know, I hate to give waffly answers, but really it is a it's a it's a maybe maybe sort of uh, kind of answer there um, really does depend on a on a bunch of different things. Yeah, so I think that is the end of our uh, our current questions there. Do you want to do you want to do your uh, your sign off there? Yeah, I'll we'll just take over from here, Mark, because uh, sure. uh, yeah, we just have a couple of slides just to show uh, how the BCCPD points and the IBC credits can be offered. So if you can, yeah, I'll just take over the presenter. Right here. Just give me a thumbs up, Mark, if you can see my slide. Okay. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining here, Mark. That was a great presentation. I think it was very well-rounded in terms of looking at the basics and also how to reach the higher end of the spectrum in terms of step five, uh, beginning from step one here. Uh, I'll just make some quick closing remarks for our audience. So as you might already know, this event was approved by BC Housing for CPD credits also by the AIBC for learning units, which you might be eligible for. For anyone who's looking for BC, BC Housing CPT credits, your proof of attendance will be emailed to you. Um, your registration or sign in today access the proof. Um, and also for AIBC members, you don't have to do anything on your part. Your attendee list will be sent directly to AIBC, given that you selected you are an AIBC member at the beginning of your registration. There's always time for some appreciation and acknowledgement, and I really want to thank Mark for giving his time, the well-rounded presentation. I certainly learned a lot about Step Code today. I hope all of you did. Um, and also a big thank you to our event sponsors, Fortis BC and BC Hydro, for their support in helping to grow this knowledge in, of Step Code in Fraser Valley. Uh, the City of Abbotsford staff and the CHBS staff who have worked behind the scenes to make this presentation and this webinar possible. And of course you, the audience, uh, who has joined in late for the day and also stayed, uh, stayed with us throughout this webinar. Uh, well, nothing is perfect and it's safe to assume that there are room for improvement for upcoming events. Also, if you have faced some technical difficulties logging into our event, please do, do let us know. Uh, at stepcode at abbotsford.ca. Um, if you have any feedback or the kind of events you wanna be uh, seeing in Abbotsford, uh, do let us know at this email address. Uh, it would be very valuable for us. It will help us move forward and try to improve our sessions moving forward. And with that said, we are almost closing in on our time. Uh, I would like to thank all of you again. Uh, please reach out at www.abbotsford.ca if you have any further questions or comments. Do you have any closing remarks, um, Mark? Well, I'm just getting a couple of questions here. People asking if we work in yeah, Abbotsford, sure. and of course, um, you know, happy for the the vote of confidence. People thinking it might be a good idea to work with us. Uh, unfortunately, we do not serve your area. Actually, well, that's one of the areas uh, that we that we do not serve. Just there is a lot of energy advisors, a lot of really good energy advisors. Uh, and if you uh, if you check that um, Better Homes BC website, that's where you'll find the list of of people that work in the area. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I, and if you do look, I think Mark showed in his presentation some of the key tabs where you can go and look for an energy advisor in Abbotsford. We would share that in our website and that link would be emailed to you in a post webinar email. So I guess, guess I think you will be handed that link 
so that you can look for an energy advisor in our area. Yeah, great. Well, it's been fun. Thanks for having me out. Yeah, no worries. Uh, I think we are seeing people uh, now dropping in at industry, so people are actually moving out. And thank you, everyone, for joining in. Look forward to our next events. Thank you, Jennifer, for being a part from the CHBA side. And like I said, if you have any questions, please feel free to forward it to step code at Abbott Wishing all of a very good evening and good night. Thank you all. Thanks. Later.